And there we go. All right, welcome. I'm Peter Kaufman. I'm one of the founders of the UCAN company. And I am extremely excited to be talking to all of you today because um, we have found, based on previous experience, that we have the opportunity to change some lives. And that is the most exciting thing for our company. And you'll know why as I introduce the company and why we exist. Um, I'm going to today run through a presentation. I predicted it would take 10 minutes yesterday. I think it was 15 or 20, but it seemed to be worthwhile. Reviewing what we are, who we are, why we started, what our products are, and what they might do for you. And then um, we have panelists with us, um, all of whom will introduce themselves. Uh, we have Dr. Kathy Yeckel from Yale University. She's a, a metabolism researcher. Um, she has uh, some experience with type 1. And Kathy, so I don't forget, Sarah thought it was extremely useful when you talked about the um, example in Europe of the uh, cyclist with type 1 diabetes cycling from I forget where, uh, um, Spain to uh, Ireland or wherever it was. But Sarah thought that was a good example, so make sure you please bring that up. And then we have Cliff Sherb, uh, who introduced all these folks who introduced themselves after my short presentation. But Cliff has an enormous amount of experience, uh, particularly with exercise and type 1 diabetes, his own experience, and he has an application that has been previously introduced to the Beyond Type 1 organization called Engine 1. And, it, and today he'll briefly introduce that when he introduces himself, and then subsequent to today, in the next few days, we're going to have a full, uh, full presentation demonstration of his application um, in case people would like to use it, and uh, it will probably be very useful to everybody on this call. Um, uh, Jesse uh, Levine is um, one of you. He's one of your members of the B uh, Bike Beyond Ride. Uh, he's the one that first contacted me about uh, three weeks ago, said he'd been experimenting with our products, found them extremely useful, and invited me to get involved with the organization, for UCAN to get involved with the organization and to talk directly to the Bike Beyond uh, folks that are participating uh, so that um, they all could potentially get involved with the product. And then we have Trisha Rousseau from um, Springfield College. She's a student there. She has type 1 diabetes, and she has been doing a lot of experimenting. She's majoring in um, exercise, uh, I forget, Trisha, but exercise physiology and nutrition, and has personally used her body as her lab and done a lot of experimenting with UCAN. And by the way, Trisha, Sarah thought that the information you described yesterday, your experiences with the product, were um, extremely helpful. And She's interested in prospectively having you on some sort of um, in some sort of article with Beyond Type One. So I thought that was exciting, and I'm sure you find that exciting. So those folks who introduce themselves after I go through some of this information, I do want to tell everyone that after today's call, a couple of things are going to happen. We're going to set up a discussion forum. Actually, uh, Sarah Lucas, the CEO of Beyond Type One, suggested we use the current Facebook environment, and she'll give access to uh, our panelists and to me, and so we can all interact as folks start trying the product. The other thing that's going to happen is everyone uh, will be offered free product to try, to then train on, and then to use during the ride. If you, if you, if you, after you, you know, if you decide you want to try it, if you like it and decide you want to train on it, and if you like the way you trained on it and then want to ride on it, so that'll all be made available to you uh, by you contacting Jesse Levine through the Facebook page, or he'll reach out to you. You can let him know you're interested, and we'll be getting product to everyone. So let's begin the uh, um, discussion of who we are and why we are and how it might be helpful to you. So the UCAN company is a company with a new carbohydrate. Our products are based on a new carbohydrate um, that is literally a new calorie source in the world. The reason it's so unique, sorry, I won't go there yet. Let's go there. Um, tell you what it kind of is. It's a carbohydrate that gives you energy but without sugar. And that energy is sustained, long-lasting, and really addresses needs that we found in the market because we didn't create this uh, for type 1 diabetes specifically. In fact, we didn't even create it for a market. Um, but in the market, there are issues that are facing consumers and desires they have. And right near the top of their list are lack of energy and staying away from sugar. People are starting to really understand how sugar is just very unhealthy. And they're not very interested in artificial sugars either. So you can, um, and our carbohydrate we've named Superstarch, is a, as I said, a new, new carbohydrate that gives you hours of steady energy without sugar. The reason it exists, the reason it's so unique, is because it was only developed originally, and the only reason our company exists was to help a family and a child with an extremely rare 
genetic blood sugar disease. This is a picture of Jonah. He's one of my co-founder's sons. Jonah has a disease called glycogen storage disease. Uh, there are several types. He has type 1A. In fact, it's the most common of the nine glycogen storage diseases, but nonetheless, there are only 3,000 kids in the country estimated to have uh, GSD type 1A. And, and Jonah uh, was born with this disease, and the way it manifests itself is it's a genetic disorder that causes the inhibition of the enzyme in the liver that converts glycogen to glucose. So these children can't make glucose in their livers where people normally would. Before the 70s, none of these kids survived. But in the 70s, it was discovered that if they were to eat plain cornstarch, those yellow boxes of argo cornstarch that you buy in the supermarket, that it would convert to glucose outside the liver, slowly enough to keep them alive, but only for two to three hours. So day and night, the routine for Jonah and other children with that disease was to eat cornstarch um, eight to 10 times a day, all day, all night. He had to be woken up twice a night. When he got older, when he was younger, it was fed to him through a tube in his stomach. You can see that in the middle picture when he's coming off the slide. And the thing about these kids is it's an ex and their families, it's an extraordinarily regimented life. Uh, if they miss one dose, they go into hypoglycemic shock and they don't survive. So they can't miss a dose. So we set out, uh, we the founders who knew the family, to find something that would keep Jonah uh, alive for more than just two to three hours. And in 2009, using super starch before he went to sleep, Jonah slept through the night for the first time. I won't say his parents slept through the night. They were probably, you know, checking his blood sugar all night. But he slept through the night. He got eight hours of sustained uh, livable glucose on our super starch. So the reason for that is the primary characteristic of the super starch is that it keeps blood sugar, keeps glucose remarkably stable for hours. If you look at this graph, you'll notice in the red graph that two hours after you ingest it, you're pretty much exactly where you started. Um, we compare it to maltodextrin. Um, when we started out here, we were only trying to help these children. We really didn't have any interest initially in going into sports nutrition, general nutrition, places that were, were, were playing a significant, starting to play a significant role now. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't want to test against sugar because we found uh, when we looked around that the more current products in the sports nutrition world, like those goo gels, uh, things that had come out in the last 10 to 20 years had been substituting the simple sugars with maltodextrin because it's supposed to be a better, slower, uh, less spike and crash carbohydrate. In reality, the curve looks similar to sugar, right? Um, where you're spiking your blood sugar with maltodextrin, that 60, 65% range in 35 in 30 minutes, sugars would be up in the 80, 85% range. So an improvement, but still a very similar looking curve, a little sharper spike, a little sharper crash with, with plain sugar. So we, we sustain blood sugar steadily for hours for anyone, not just people, not just kids with glycogen storage disease. The implications, and I'm going to talk now about um, general implications. Uh, we'll talk more specifically about uh, the implications for type 1 diabetes in a few minutes. But stable blood sugar gives you steady energy, first of all, to your muscles. So we've got right now 75 college teams. We've got 28 professional teams, uh, 12 in the NFL. New England Patriots just played the third Super Bowl on this. They were the first professional team to use our product. Uh, when they started using it, I was delivering it to them white, pow white powder in plastic bags uh, before it was a product, as I say. And when they started using it, they would ask their dietitian, what's in this stuff? B6, caffeine. They thought there were stimulants in the product. There are no stimulants in the product at all. But what they were mistaking was for a well-conditioned athlete, an hour, hour and a half into a strength workout, a practice on the field, to not feel their energy drop, to not feel the fatigue, that they were used to feeling, they were just staying steady. So they thought there was some sort of delayed stimulant kicking in. But in reality, all we were doing was keeping them steady and just not letting them drop when they normally would. The second implication, which, which we think could be as or more important than steady energy to your muscles eventually, is steady energy to your brain. Unless you're in ketosis, which not too many people are, <clears throat> blood sugar is, glucose is the only thing that feeds your brain. And we actually get emails sometimes from parents of children with attention deficit telling us that kids do better in school when they have UCAN for breakfast. And if you think about it, you give a kid oatmeal, bagel, cereal for breakfast, the energy to their brain literally goes up like that blue line, comes down an hour and a half after they ate breakfast, they're sitting in math class and they've had that up and down in energy to the brain. We're keeping that energy nice and steady to the brain. And then the last thing, besides all the uh, athletes and um, uh, teams that are using our product, and by the way, we really are best known so far uh, in the endurance world. We started out in the endurance running world with the top marathon in the United States, Meb Kofleski, st also starting to use our product before it was a product. We had seeded it with some top sports dietitians in the country, and he got a hold of it. 
Um, we announced our first product at the Boston Marathon with Meb. He's, he's won Boston, New York, and he's gotten a silver medal in the Olympics. No other athlete has ever done all three in marathon. And so Meb started using it. He's been a spokesperson for us. So we're pretty well known in the running world. Um, it's spilled over to triathlon, a little bit in cycling, not as much. But in any case, um, uh, we um, – oh, I just lost my train of thought. I apologize. But, but in any case um, – we're well known, I've wanted to say, in the endurance world. So, so there's a lot of relevance to specifically the event that you all are going to be uh, embarking on. Um, sorry, I know where I was going. Besides the athletes, including the endurance athletes like Mev, I apologize for that, we are also being used at Lifetime Fitness. It's a gym chain that was voted the number one uh, gym chain in the United States a few months ago by Men's Health. And we're a significant product there for the personal trainers to help their clients lose weight. The average person is attending Lifetime Fitness to see a personal trainer, to drop a few pounds, get back into fitness, um, get back into exercise. And the third characteristic is you're just not as hungry when your blood sugar doesn't drop. Your brain doesn't tell your body, hey, body, sugar's low. You need to eat again. So it helps with cravings. And so like Lifetime Fitness, they're telling their clients to use you can before they come to see them to have better exercise. They'll have a better second half of the workout because their energy won't drop. And then they're also telling them to use it to replace at least once a day, the least healthy carbs in their diets. So if they're having cereal, oatmeal, or bagels for breakfast, have a healthy breakfast, you can breakfast shake. If they're having a, um, a two or three in the afternoon, they're getting low at, uh, at work. I'm sorry for the phone ringing in the background. If they're getting low at work, they tell them to uh, have a UCAN bar uh, in their desk and keep their blood sugar stable and not be as hungry in the afternoon. If they're eating at night, something I had a problem with, break that nighttime eating problem by having a UK shake, dessert shake, an hour after dinner or a bar after dinner. So at Lifetime Fitness, the uh, uh, it's become a very important product. People using the product five, seven, ten times a week to incorporate it into their regular diets. Um, so the other thing is, because we don't have a spike in blood sugar, the pancreas, when when you don't have type one diabetes does not see anything it really needs to react to. And so the insulin response to our carbohydrate is, all, is very negligible. This is before, during, and after exercise. This is a clinical trial that was conducted at the University of uh, Oklahoma. These were trained cyclists. They ingested either maltodextrin or superstarch 30 minutes before they got on their bikes. Uh, it was a double-blind clinical trial. The folks that were involved in the trial and the athletes uh, that were on the bikes neither knew what they were, what they were having when. They came in different weeks. The maltodextrin, as you'd expect, gave them a big spike in insulin in response, in response to the uh, spike in glucose. It gets muted during the exercise period. They re-ingested whichever carb they had taken at the beginning after two and a half hours of cycling. Uh, they then rested for 90 minutes, still hooked up to the metabolic cart so we could see how the carb behaved post-exercise. The spike in insulin is not quite as large as the initial spike because they've been exercising, but still significant. With our super starch, there was a very small insulin response before, during, and after exercise. The insulin response to our super starch is lower than the insulin response to protein. So we have the only carb in the world, completely natural, I'm gonna tell you how it's made in a minute, completely absorbed, or almost completely absorbed. It's all used by the body as energy, and yet the insulin response is lower than the insulin response to protein. There's nothing like this in the world. And, and although we're not making medical claims to type one diabetes, it becomes kind of a no-brainer for somebody with type one diabetes to find usefulness out of it, because you're essentially getting free energy without the need for insulin to process and use the energy. You're not going to use, you're not going to use zero insulin. That's not my point. We'll talk about the subtleties and how much insulin you should consider using and, and experiment with. It's going to be different for everybody. But you just see that um, I'm sure this is an impressive graph to folks who look at these kinds of things, all of you, all the time. Um, the last thing that we did prove, studied and proved in the clinical trials, because insulin is a storage hormone, we were able to show that the level of utilization of fat during exercise, and if you don't have, uh, we like to tell people that, um, that are trying to change their bodies at Lifetime Fitness, if you don't have a double banana smoothie with 60 grams of sugar right after your workout to shut down the fat burning by spiking your insulin, you'll continue to burn a significant amount of fat after exercise for people that are trying to lean out. We have a lot of the college and professional team uh, coaches and dietitians using our product uh, quite specifically to help their athletes lean out, lose body fat as they gain mass and, and gain much more muscle than, than uh, fat in addition to the characteristic of they just wanted to lose weight, they won't be as hungry after they exercise, feel like they need to eat their fingers after they finish exercising. So those are all the science characteristics. The one other thing that you should know, this is just a summary slide, 
is that you can, the super starch and you can, the car is very gentle on the stomach. It's an enormous molecule, and large molecules leave the stomach quickly, so it leaves the stomach almost immediately. So it doesn't bother the stomach, it digests as it moves through the intestines, and essentially it's time-releasing glucose out of the intestines directly into the bloodstream at the rate your body needs it, instead of dumping it all at once, like simple, fast-acting carbs. And then it dumps, it, it, it um, releases it directly into the bloodstream, never going near the liver, where Jonah, kids like him, would not be able to metabolize the carbs to work with them at all. I wanted to mention there is some science. Uh, this wasn't done by us. It wasn't funded by us. But there was a trial. I should, I'll, I'll, send, well, I'll send this paper to everyone. You might want to show it to your endocrinologist. It was published by the uh, London College Hospital, uh, sorry, London University, University College London Hospital, uh, that proved that the superstarch, they call it slow-release starch here, it was before we named it superstarch, helps prevent nocturnal hypoglycemia uh, in individuals that have type 1 diabetes. So um, this could be uh, potentially extremely helpful to folks uh, at night um, when you're struggling to figure out what you should have before you go to sleep. Uh, one other individual that was going to join us on this call, but he is right now in Puerto Vallarta. Um, I loosely use the word escaping because I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm sure he um, loves his kids, but he's uh, with his wife in Puerto Vallarta, left his kids with his uh, mother or mother-in-law, Dr. Dan. I think a lot of people know Dr. Dan. Uh, he's an advisor to Beyond Type 1. So he told me that he was happy to share his experience with you, Ken, because he couldn't be on the call. He would have liked to be. And we'll see what he says here. Um, he talks about how he uses it with his exercise. He has a shake uh, before he runs, five to ten mile runs. He has a shake before he rides. He takes a bar, has a bar halfway through. And then before bedtime, um, if he's done a lot of exercise, he likes to have a shake or a bar before bedtime. Um, says he accompanies that with a 20 to 30 percent basal reduction, starting 30 minutes to an hour prior and lasting through his exercise, maintains a very steady glucose profile during his exercise. He notices a rise in his glucose after his exercise is complete. Feel free to ask questions or any of our panelists that have experienced you can with their type 1 diabetes can, can mention whether they've experienced that. Again, everyone's experience may be, um, uh, I'll use the word a little, may, may be significantly different, but I think everyone's going to find that it maintains blood sugar better than other carbohydrates. And then he addressed that, he says, with a nudge or micro of insulin. So um, he also mentions in that last line something that we will be interested in for those that are uh, willing to share. We'll be interested in seeing your CGM profiles, your data, uh, before you can, if you can keep some of the history before we get the product out to you, if you can record some of that history, and then with you can. Um, and then <clears throat> there'll be an excellent way of recording it if you decide to use it. Um, uh, as I said, Cliff Shreve's going to talk about Engine 1, which is a fantastic application to capture data. But that data goes beyond just carbohydrate intake, intake and insulin. It, it includes all, all your eating. Um, it includes a whole lot of things that will be helpful uh, to capture the data, but also actually to help, you, help guide you in your insulin utilization when you're exercising. And Cliff will discuss that only for a minute or two today, and then, as I say, we'll have a session on that specifically where he can go into a lot of detail on that. So Jesse was quite willing to share his data with us, um, which we appreciate, Jesse Levine. And um, Jesse, I'm going to need a reminder. I, I don't know if I've been calling you Levine, and it's actually Levine, but I think it's Levine. Let me know when I unmute you later to introduce yourself. But what you see here is, um, just at a very simple level, that he moved from pre-UCAN in the fair to good range of glycemic control, he moved into the excellent range. And so that's what's really particularly exciting about the opportunity here, we think, for all of you. And Dr. Yako can discuss that further um, when she gets on. So let me tell you how you can uh, superstarch is made, because everybody wants to know exactly what it is they'd be eating. So what you're going to be eating is the starting ingredient is non-GMO corn. It's a specific type of non-GMO corn. It's fully tested. All our products are non-GMO. All our products are gluten-free. All of our products have nutrition facts labels. They're foods. None of them are supplements. And we take this specific type of non-GMO corn, and all we do is cook it. And the way we cook it is with a patented cooking process. It took eight years, almost eight years, to fully develop and scale for commercial purposes this cooking process. When we started, it was only being produced in a tenth of a pound, that little plastic bag. But all we do for almost 40 hours a batch is treat the non-GMO corn with water and heat. And that's it. It's less processed than oatmeal. It's one of the most natural foods, except that we have not yet found an organic source of this specific type of non-GMO corn. But other than it not being organic, it's one of the most natural foods you'd find in the world. Um, 
what happens during this cooking process of drying it and moistening it and drying it and moistening it over and over with different levels of moisture is the molecule changes significantly. It becomes a very complex molecule. It takes the body a long time to absorb and digest. And as I mentioned before, it digests as it moves through the intestines and releases the glucose into the bloodstream. But while it's, while, while it's slowly digesting because it's a complex carb, it's breaking down slowly. It's breaking down almost completely. And that was the combination that the kids like Jonah needed to stay alive. Something that didn't break down, well, something that broke down quickly, of course, just didn't keep them alive at all. And then something that didn't break down, like fibers that just pass through and don't become glucose, that don't break down to energy, also wouldn't keep them alive. So we needed this important combination, and that's what this process does. It also was decided way up front that because it was going to be used, be used by children and babies with a disease, we were not going to, uh, there was not going to be a process developed unless it was completely natural. So let me tell you about the products, but first let me check and see what Mary's question is, in case it's uh, relevant to what I've said so far, or should it be discussed afterwards? Uh, will the team be getting the engine? Oh, something about the Engine 1 app. So let's go to that question after I finish this um, introduction. So I just want to tell you what the products look like. We've got powders and we've got bars, and then we have one complementary product, which you also may find useful, and, and we'll be happy to provide it to you. Um, we've got uh, powders that are primarily the super starch. There are very few other ingredients in the powder. It's the most concentrated version uh, way of getting your super starch. They have some natural uh, flavor. They have some sweetener. In six of the, uh, well, to be specific, one of the flavors is just plain super starch. It has nothing else in it. It's intended to be a mix-in with things that you like to have, obviously with low to no sugar. Then we have uh, five flavors that are sweetened with either stevia or monk fruit extract. So those are our natural flavors. And we do still have three flavors that are sweetened with sucralose. The only reason we have artificial sweeteners still in our line, although I have found, as I talk to people with type 1 diabetes, they don't necessarily have a big aversion to uh, sucralose to Splenda. But in any case, um, we've only kept them. We'd like to be an all-natural line. We've kept them because the monk fruit is not yet allowed in Canada and Europe and the... Uh, Stevia is only allowed at, at very, very minuscule levels, and we're above that to sweeten our products. So we keep it so we can sell outside the United States. Um, we have two of the, and then we have two more flavors that we, to which we add protein. Um, the vanilla cream, which you see on the screen here, and then we have a chocolate. The vanilla cream is sweetened with monk fruit. The chocolate is one of the original flavors that's sweetened with sucralose. And then we have our bars. Um, now, the, the, the powders... In the individual serving packets, which is probably what we won't be sending you, we'll probably sending you, maybe we'll send you that at the beginning if you want to trial it, but then after that we'd probably send you the containers. Maybe the packets will be um, helpful as you're traveling. But uh, the, the packets have 30 grams of our super starch in them. The tubs came after the packets. We were getting uh, some, some folks, especially lighter weight women, telling us, I only need half a packet, 50, 60 calories, for my hour-long run, hour and a half, even hour and a half run, or my uh, yoga class. So this is in the um, containers, and I'm sorry to confuse everybody right here at the beginning when I'm giving you so much information, but I just like to be complete. We can always repeat this stuff later. The serving size in the container, the scoop, is about two-thirds of a packet. So you're getting 20 grams of super starch instead of 30. And then on the side of the container, it just says, consider two scoops when you're going to go over two hours of exercise. Over three hours of exercise, consider three scoops, which would be a packet and a half. So uh, those are the powders. The bars, of course, have more ingredients in them, but they're nonetheless designed to be stable blood sugar bars. They do have a little sugar, six to seven grams. We haven't gotten it out of them yet. It's in there actually not as a sweetener. It's actually in there to hold the super starch and protein together. Strange as that sounds. It was strange to me not having this kind of uh, uh, nutrition uh, product experience in the past, but we're going to work to get that out. But in any case, even though there's six to seven grams of sugar, because the bars have 10 to 15 grams of, of super starch, depending upon the flavor. They have uh, a fair amount of coconut oil or cocoa butter. It's a healthy fat. Some fiber, five grams. They're not protein delivery bars. They have five or six grams of protein. They're designed to be stable blood sugar bars, not protein delivery bars. But that combination of ingredients keeps blood sugar quite stable. And that's why Dr. Dan was able to use it. And others here can mention how they've used the bars versus the powders. And then we have one complementary product. Um, the uh, you can hydrate. I say complimentary because it does not have any of our super starch in it. So it doesn't make us unique, but it's a really cool hydration product that complements 
our superstarch products really well. We tell you get your energy, get your calories from our superstarch products, the powders and the bars. Hydrate has zero calories. There's nothing in there, uh, certainly no sugar, but there's no calories at all. It's all natural. It again has a nutrition facts label, so it's a food as well, not a supplement. But what's cool, I think, about it besides those things is it's got a perfect mix of electrolytes in it. It was designed by an Olympic dietitian for us, the U.S. Olympic, uh, the Olympic dietitian for the U.S. triathlon team, Bob Siebelhar, to exactly match the ratio of electrolytes a person loses when they sweat. So it's 3 to 1 sodium to potassium, 2 to 1 sodium to chloride, 20 to 1 sodium to calcium. And then he told us that virtually all athletes and most people are magnesium deficient. So he said double the magnesium. Average sweat would be 12 parts sodium to 1 part magnesium. He asked us, suggested to us that we double it, and we did. It's 6 to 1 sodium to magnesium. So we would, we would suggest it has a perfect uh, mix uh, ratios of electrolytes for, um, for exercise. Uh, just to, uh, I kind of alluded to it before, I don't have to repeat it, but this was, if I hadn't gotten to it, to let you know that uh, you are either already athletes or be out, be about to become significant athletes. I noticed on the website there were one or two cyclists who hadn't really cycled much in the past, but you're in great company. We are the best kept secret in sports. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, 28 professional U.S. Uh, professional teams using the product, top endurance athletes across the world are using the product. I recently found out that both the male and female winners of the CrossFit Games were on UCAN. There was an article just this morning, I was so happy to see it, in the New York Times talking about the fitness level of the UConn women's basketball team. And somewhere deep in the article it says they use a fast, a slow-releasing carb before every game. They don't mention us, but we know it's us. So that was cool. They've played every one of the games on their streak on, on UCAN. So we're a good company as, uh, as athletes is the point I wanted to make. So, you know, from Jonah to athletes to what I think is perhaps, you know, as exciting as when we change the lives of the kids with glycogen storage disease to people with type 1 diabetes, we are so excited about the opportunity to change lives in that world and in particular to really start. I mean, we had, of course, we've had a number of people, you're going to hear some of them in a minute, that have used our products to change their lives. But um, this is the first organized event that we'll be involved with and the first organized group that we'll be involved with uh, with our products that have, uh, that have type 1 diabetes. So truly exciting for us. Thanks for everybody paying such great attention. Um, the one question that came in so far, as I said, was from Mary. She asked, will the team be getting the Engine 1 app for free in addition to the UCAN product? It seems to be suggested that the athletes use both the UCAN and the Glucose Advisors app. That's what uh, Cliff's company is called. And if this is the case, I'd love to know if the Engine 1 service will be available for free to them. Thanks. I'm going to let Cliff answer that question. Um, and yes, we do think the combination of the UCAN product and the Engine 1 app are ideal, but you absolutely can decide to use one and not the other. You can decide you don't want to experiment with our products, and that's fine. Um, that's, you know, there's, there's personal elements to that decision for everybody, of course. And you can still decide that the Engine 1 will be extremely helpful to you. And I don't know why you wouldn't use the Engine 1 app. Maybe, um, I don't know why, but. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Um, Mary, I'm unmuting you. Siddharth so said he couldn't hear anything this whole time, so he's exiting. He exited. Mary, you must have been able to hear me if you uh, asked <laughs> you must Mary, you must have been able to hear me if you asked that question, right? I, I must have what, sorry? You've been able to hear me for the last twenty minutes, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've I've been on. Yeah, <laughs> I've been able to hear. Okay, Siddhar Siddhar Chaba just said he he left because he said I can't hear anything, so he exited and he's going to join again. Oh, maybe that was temporary. All right, I just got really nervous because when I'm doing this, I can't tell who can hear me. That no one had heard a word I said in the last twenty minutes would have you know you can imagine how horrible that would have been. So <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. I can I can hear you. Um, and I'm sure yes. if anyone else has any problems, they'll let you know. Yeah, Dana said we can hear you. Okay, thanks, Dana. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves, and as I said, Cliff will uh, introduce Engine One as he as he describes his experience with UCAN as well. And um, yeah, the people can certainly use Engine One and not use UCAN, and they can use UCAN, and I don't know why they wouldn't use Engine One, but they don't have to. So I'm meeting you again, Mary. I'm going to go to the panel. I'm going to start with Jesse today, Jesse. If you'll unmute your mic, I'll put you on. 
Can you hear me, Jesse? I know I didn't, I didn't introduce you first yesterday. Okay, so Jesse, so I'm going to introduce you first today because you're the one that started this whole thing with, with Beyond Type 1, and I'd like you to describe, um, you know, why you decided it would be useful for us to get involved with the organization, particularly with Bike Beyond and what your experience has been. Thanks. Um, yeah, hey, everyone. Um, so, Peter, if you pronounced my name correctly, it's, it's Levine. Um, I'm very excited to be on this call with everybody. Uh, some of you I'm talking to for the first time. Um, I can't hear you, but that's okay. We'll, we'll get to know each other pretty soon enough. Um, so the way I got uh, involved with UCAN is um, my endocrinologist in Houston, um, Dr. Jay Kushner, is the director of the clinic that Dr. Dan works at. And they had both been mentioning UCAN to me for, for um, a little bit um, to uh, get a tighter control of my blood sugars. But it never really occurred to me to look into it until I started looking into nutrition for the bike ride. Um, and how I was going to go about this massive feat. Um, so I bought some UCAN, and the first time I tried it, um, I, um, I did it without exercise. So I drank, I drank a shake in the morning um, at 8 a.m., and um, I just took one unit of insulin to, uh, to cover the initial spike. Um, as I, but it was like on the go as a nudge, and then um, I didn't eat anything else throughout the whole day. Um, until 6 p.m. and my blood sugar was completely stable. It was just a flat line throughout, um, and that was amazing. So after that, I was like, "This is got to use it." Um, so since then, I've been experimenting more and more. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of my experimentation has been done uh, without exercise, um, just by nature of being at school. So um, as as Peter talked about, uh, it it really like craves craves hunger. So if I'm if I know, if I know I'm going to be sitting down for a long period of time and working on assignment, um, I'll eat a UCAN bar, and then I just don't think about my blood sugar at all, and it's just a straight line across, um, which is just the coolest feeling. So um, I'm really excited to to use UCAN for the ride. Uh, as I've been using it through exercise, it totally takes the mental worry out of my blood sugars. Um, usually when I'm riding, it's like how can I time this 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 glue this goo. Um, you know, I have to keep looking at it all the time. But when I drink a UCAN, um, I just feel, I feel pretty sure that my blood sugar is going to stay stable, which is the feeling that I want uh, all the time. So um, I know this ride is going to be uh, a huge challenge in so many ways. But um, I the goal for me is to make my diabetes and the numbers um, as the, the least amount of struggle possible. Um, and and I really think that UCAN, uh, I'm, I'm I will be using UCAN to, to help me do that. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited for this intersection between UCAN and Beyond Type 1 and, uh, and for you all to be able to sample the products and, and, and give it a shot, see what you think. <clears throat> so that's what I have to say about UCAN. Fantastic. Thank you, Jesse. And thanks again for getting us involved, you know, with this. This is just, as I've said so many times, so exciting for us. Um, I'm going to introduce next uh, Cliff, and then I'll go to Dr. Yeckel. Uh, Cliff... Um, you there, Cliff? I'm here. Thanks, Peter. And, uh, oh, thank you. Thanks to uh, the Beyond Type 1 community for uh, having me on board here to chat with you guys for a bit. And uh, yeah, a little bit about my, my background. Um, I've been active in the sport of uh, triathlon for about 15 years and uh, racing as a, an elite Type 1 for, for much of that. And i um, fortunate to hold the fastest record for a half Ironman uh, as a type one and the second fastest for an Ironman um, tri distance triathlon. So I'm also a coach and founder of TriStar Athletes, which is uh, an endurance sports company. And I coach people all over the world from beginner to you know advanced and professional. And then uh, through all my learning and experience throughout the years, I've started a company called Glucose Advisors where we basically created an app that uh, helps you in real time decide how much to eat uh, based on the insulin that you've been taking uh, as a type 1 diabetic. So it's a, it's a pretty new app, pretty novel app, and uh, we're excited to uh, get it into your hands to try it out. And uh, to your question about uh, how can we incorporate Engine One and will it be free for the team, there is a, a social aspect to it, and the component is you can share it with friends on Facebook or text, and you'll you'll basically get an extended free trial, and that can last you up to a month. So if you you try it out, you like it, great, and then you can sign up. If not, you can keep extending it. So um, now I'll tell you guys a little bit about my experience with UCAN. It's something that 
I've used throughout my career in training and racing. And, uh, you know, I'd best describe it as <laughs> steel cut oatmeal in a bottle, or I like to call it Popeye's spinach because it packs a mean punch. Um, I really like the way it has lasting and sustaining energy and, you know, it does leave you very satiated and full and extremely good and balanced blood sugar as Jesse suggests. So I, I really like it for all those reasons. During training, uh, I, I recommend it to people who are doing their base phase training when they'd like to lean out. Um, it's really great in helping type 1s lower their total daily dose of insulin, I've found. And, you know, during shorter workouts lasting 30 minutes to two hours, um, it gives you great sustained energy with, you know, very minimal insulin spike, which is just, again, tremendous. Uh, I also actually re recommend it quite a bit to people who, before major events, uh, need to taper their exercise down to help them keep satiated, their energy level high, um, which is it's really helpful, especially like three to five days before major events. Um, Love you can for snacking, um, you know, for working out in the evening. Um, and, uh, you know, for the type 1 diabetic athlete, it's just, again, really stable, um, stable blood sugar. And what I've also found over the years, too, is um, the athletes who have, been, who have been using it consistently and consistently really like one to two packets minimum a day have just leaner body composition in general and we know with leaner body composition you know you have a higher vo2 max which means you're, you're basically going to perform better so uh for all those reasons uh i'm, I'm pretty pretty jazzed about you can and um uh, it's a it's a product that i'm happy to stand behind so um and that's my background in a nutshell and uh happy to to answer any questions you guys have um please feel free to email me at cliff at tristarathlete.com and uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to work through things with you. Thanks, Cliff. Hey, I know you don't like to uh, talk about it too much, but your Ironman was a 9.07. What was your half Ironman time? I've never asked you. Yeah, four hours and 16 minutes. So the splits for, for the Ironman was uh, 55 swim, um, a four-hour, 48-minute bike, and a 3.16 marathon, and then... Uh, my swim for the half was 28 minutes. The bike was about uh, 215, and the run was uh, 1 128. So, yeah, <laughs> pretty pretty quick. It was it's been some years, but it was pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Oh, uh, that's great. Thank you, Cliff. Fantastic. And as you guys ask questions, you're going to get some really professional answers from Cliff, as well as uh, certainly everybody else. So, um, Dr. Yako, Kathy, let's go to you, please. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here today. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm, um, I'm, I don't have type 1, so I'm one of the people on the panel that doesn't have type 1. I, what I do is I'm a researcher at Yale, and I've, I'm an exercise physiologist. I'm somebody who's done a lot with human metabolism and nutrition, and I am very keen on helping people sort of bridge the gap between sort of the evidence-based research and how it really helps people in real life, which is why I've always been um, very attracted to UCAN and I've sort of been consulting and advising and reviewing things for, for the UCAN folks for um, pretty much since the beginning. Um, I, I, ha I am really somebody that has a very, very diverse sort of systems level so I can think about what's happening in the fat, what's happening in the liver, what's happening in the muscle, um, and that's often sort of Un, uh, unusual. Um, one of the things that that I've you know been trying to to, to I, I've just to let you know I've I've done work that's been for everything from um, children who are obese to little old ladies with you know prediabetes and diabetes and and everything from sedentary people to to really elite athletes. So I've gotten a real great perspective and experience over time um, in the type one world in terms of literature. Some of, we we've been doing a study in the Netherlands. Where where we've been, where we did a really big shout out to people who rec exercise regularly. We had over 300 people participate in that, and it was it was very eye opening. Uh, the, the Cliff's response about you know trying to use you know the idea that the UCAN has started to help people lower their total insulin. That's one of the things that is such a big risk factor um, in general for regular exercisers, and we found that they were more protected when basal insulin and the total and that was reflective of total insulin. And was was lowered, um, and they also were much more protected if 
if they could keep their blood sugar steady during exercise, they were much less likely to have any problem in, with nocturnal hypoglycemia, so that those two really do go together, and the vice versa. If people were having problems, they were then set up to be more likely have problems overnight. Um, so we're just digging into some of the nitty-gritty about how people adjust their, their values, but, but we know that there are certain things that hold true. The, the ladies here in the group, um, unfortunately, the, there, there was the, the, the vulnerability in women to, ha to be higher at risk during the day during exercise-associated hypoglycemia, so that's sort of good for you to know. Um, going into this huge challenging event. But um, the couple of things, one, I know Peter has this figure up of, of Jesse's and just, just to let you know that, you know, some of these data we can actually sort of compare across people and all I did was take his beautiful drop in mean glucose using the UCAN. He went from 118 to 111 and his standard deviation, of, of, so the variability around these days because he gave us a couple of weeks of pre-data and a couple of weeks of post-data, you know, data that he had been on the UCAN. So it was very simple and this is the this is the kind of data that that um, researchers use to sort of be able to compare across a group or to, or to compare within an individual. And then there's been a scale with this type of, of glycemic variability that's been created. And you can see that he dropped into the excellent level, which is good. Um, the other piece of information that I could, I could say right now, just because Sarah mentioned it as being very um, helpful, um, it, Sarah from the um, Beyond Type 1 last night, uh, um, there has been one trial. In other words, there isn't much <laughs> there isn't much real life data in in terms of type one doing real extensive day to day to day types of riding or other types of events. But there's been one recent study that was done where the riders ro rode from Barcelona to Vienna. So it was a 15 day ride. So nothing close to the 60 days that you guys are doing. Um, but they they did track both people with type one. But the cool thing was is they also used people that didn't have type 1 and so everyone wore the CGM and they were able to show that the challenge of keeping even your mean blood sugar sort of stable over time with these types of rides and in fact everyone the type 1 and the people with without type 1 their mean glucose as a function of each five-day increment that they that they averaged together was dropping over time which tells me that that they're that they're having trouble sustaining enough liver glycogen um, to, to keep that buffer uh, stable. And so it really starts to point to um, not only products like UCAN that, that can really, really help sort of take the pressure off the liver um, in terms of supporting blood glucose in the background, but also the idea that nutrition is going to play a huge role for you as, you as you take on this challenge in terms of making sure at the end of each day that you're, you're able to try to do as much as you can to replenish not only muscle glycogen, but the but liver glycogen as well in terms of the your dietary choices. So I guess um, unless there's some questions, why don't we, we can move on to the next panelist. Yeah, we'll go to questions certainly afterwards. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Yako, or you know, she usually goes by Kathy, which we appreciate. Um, maybe it'll be Dr. Kathy, like Dr. Dan, as we move along. Uh, Trisha, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yep, done. There you go. Thank you. All right. There we go. Well, first, I just want to say um, I'm really grateful to be on this panel here. Great to talk to you guys just about UCAN and our experiences with it. Peter, I want to extend another thank you to you just for this opportunity. Um, my name is Trisha Russo. I'm 24 years old, currently studying at Springfield College and studying actually to be an, a clinical exercise physiologist and would eventually like to kind of combine that um, as a CDE to work with the diabetic population. This is kind of my goals. Um, I've been an athlete, athlete most of my life, um, pretty much all of it, and I've also had type 1 for about 20 years. So it's always been an ongoing battle, as all of you know, um, just kind of figuring out what is that balance between nutrition, exercise, and my blood sugars. Uh, in terms of UCAN, I learned of UCAN actually last summer while working at a Fleet Feet Sports, a specialty run store, and my boss learned of the product at a conference and asked me uh, if he thought I should bring it in because I do a lot of their nutrition there. And 
uh, I started to kind of research what it was and thought it would probably be a good product to bring in. Seth from UCAN came to the shop and told us a little bit more about the product. And this really only kind of piqued my interest in the product in general. And I immediately certainly thought of the potential benefits for a type 1 diabetic. Um, now, I'm not an ultra athlete, and I'm not about to begin a cross-country ride, but I'm a type 1 diabetic who runs, and I've really locked, locked, latched on uh, to UCAN. So up until this point in my training, um, so I, in the past five or six years, have done a lot more um, running, increasing my distance, starting out certainly with 5Ks, 10Ks, and then some half marathons and a marathon last year. And I found that, um, especially as I've increased my distance, my blood sugar tends to drop a lot earlier. So I have a pretty fast drop, a significant drop at like three and a half to four miles into a run. And I began to start to, con to counteract that with simple sugars. And I'll say in my marathon training last year, I felt like I was consuming enough simple sugars through goo or glucose to really solve the world hunger crisis. Um, it was a lot, and I was ready to be done with them at the end of that training. But uh, much like Jesse, I began experimenting with the UCAN um, when I, as soon as I learned of it with no exercise. Um, I... I'm not sure if this was a mistake or good for my education, but a bolus for an entire UCAN bar one day as I was kind of exper experimenting and found that my blood sugar dropped dramatically. And so I think that's a testament just to the um, extended release or slow release of this starch. And I, I, I mean, I certainly learned from that. But I then began to really translate kind of what I knew of how my body was responding to UCAN at rest to exercise with some shorter runs and then incorporating it into some longer runs and training. And I've really found that um, in terms of my shorter runs, I tend to drop as soon as I am done. And so with UCAN, my drop in blood sugar immediately following my run um, is either much smaller or non-existent. And then within longer runs, um, again, I, I would tend to drop around three and a half to four miles, even with a pretty significantly reduced basal. And with UCAN, um, that drop is much more gradual, as well as uh, much further along within my run, which just has been huge for me in training. Um, mostly for half marathons, but again, training for another marathon. So I think the two largest benefits I've seen so far in experimenting with it um, and exercise has been that sustained energy throughout my exercise, as well as decreasing my needs for multiple sources of fast acting carbs during that exercise. Um, so my suggestions to you guys as you kind of begin, if you haven't used UCAN before, is really starting again without that exercise just to see how your body's responding and experiment with snacking and in fact I just had a bar in between class in this call so it's certainly a benefit to have even throughout your normal day but um, really get a baseline for how your body's responding and then work your way to see you know what what are your insulin needs how are they shifting and then translating that to exercise Hi, you know, this is Kathy again, and Trisha just made a really good point that that should um, should be should be brought to everybody's attention when she talks about the fact that if you're using something like you can, which is just stabilizing your blood sugar and not having to complete, you know, constantly take in simple sugars, what that allows you to do is burn more fat. And for a ride like this, not to keep, you know, to keep the balance as much as you can toward fat, efficient fat burning is is going to be just a tremendous asset for for all of your you know your glycogen stores and these kinds of things because endurance training you're, you're always trying to see as much use of fat as you can and and one of the 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 horrible challenges of type 1 is that you're you know you're constantly having to fiddle with the blood sugar and keeping it normal so to be able to have something like you can that allows you to to not have to keep taking in simple carbs also will will keep you balanced toward fat oxidation. I just thought, thought I would add that in there. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Kathy. Yeah, thank you so much, Trisha and, uh, and Kathy. Um, I wanted to mention um, one thing, and then any of the panelists may want to add to this point. Uh, there's one, one panelist who was on last night who couldn't be here today, Roy Collins. Roy uh, is currently studying to be an endocrinologist at the University of St. Louis Medical School. He couldn't be on today, but 
freed up a little time yesterday because he has his medical boards in a couple of weeks and he's just overwhelmed. But in any case, he used UCAN. He has type 1 diabetes. He used UCAN when he played football at Yale. That's where I first met Roy. Um, Yale at that time had a small budget. They bought, I remember, about $1,000 of UCAN for the team to use during a few games. But they spent $1,200 on Roy. He was playing right tackle with type 1 diabetes. He started using it in and around his workouts. And I, before I ever sent him that published paper about nocturnal hypoglycemia, I started using it at night to help him at night. And so Roy has been helpful to us over the past uh, three years. Anytime someone calls into the company or inquires that has type 1 diabetes and wants to exercise, or maybe the parent of a, of a person with type 1 diabetes, he's very helpful. And on one call where I was listening in, the father of a, uh, a boy who was 15 years old who played, um, I think it was in the World Series Little League, uh, Little League World Series, said that he had tried the UCAN, his son had tried it, and his blood sugar um, didn't, he didn't get any spike from the UCAN, and so he just kind of drifted down as he went through his exercise. And Roy pointed out to him that Roy needed to get his blood sugar up to the 120, 130 range, then have his UCAN, and then it would keep him steady throughout his workout. And so that came up yesterday on the call last night, and Roy said, yeah, you don't want to use this if you're already low. So uh, anybody on the panel want to add to that or comment on that? But I, I, oh, this, this does remind me of one thing. When you first trial UCAN, we would strongly recommend that you trial it initially in a controlled environment when your blood sugar is kind of, is, you know your blood sugar is to be pretty calm. So after you've gotten past perhaps your morning, any morning issues uh, where you can actually just relax in your, in your living room and sit for, for uh, several hours, have the UCAN monitor your CGM readings and just see how it works before you try it with exercise where your blood sugar is going to be more difficult to control and, you, and you, you know, there'll be more challenges uh, and more variability. Uh, I'll just call on you, Kathy. Um, you want to add to that, or I'll call on Cliff in a second as well. I'll, I'll put you both on in case either one wants to say anything. Well, I think in, in, in terms of ha having the controlled environment, I think that's a really great way to start, and it's it's it it's good to see how your individual you know how your body how your metabolism reacts just under normal conditions just like you would probably do with any new food um, and 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 go from there because it's and and just to keep in mind that it isn't it isn't designed to be um, the beauty of it is is that it's it is slow releasing it's not it's, but the the contrast to that is it's not designed for rescue right it's like for me I'm asthmatic I I have a I have a a sustaining inhaler that's a corticosteroid, but then I have the rescue inhaler if I need it. So it's the same kind of principle. You have to you have to have both um, things in your arsenal to make sure. But this is in the background. This is your safety net um, going on. Cliff, do you want to add anything to that? I'm having trouble unmuting your mic. Yeah, Peter, I, I think uh, all everything that's been mentioned so far is, is spot on. One additional thought I would add to everyone who's, uh, you know, interested in UCAN and, and making it work for them, insulin on board is the biggest driver prior to any activity as to whether or not your blood sugar is going to go down. And the more insulin on board you have, the more glucose you really have to have to offset it. So uh, oftentimes with UCAN, because of how slow it's absorbed, um, it's really matching, you know, and getting that uh, insulin on board lower prior to an activity. So th there is some timing to get it right. Um, I did send some notes along that hopefully we can pass to everybody, Peter. But uh, yeah, I would say everything that's been mentioned before, plus just, you know, the one thing you really want to look at is that pump. And if you're, if you are on pump, um, knowing how much insulin on board, active insulin is still working on lowering blood sugar. That's that's very critical. Uh, and then. Um, yeah, testing, testing frequently to get that number right. Uh, some people like to start a little higher and then run it down. Uh, I think it really depends on what kind of regimen you're on. You know, if you're on a pump versus, you know, you're taking Lantus, uh, those are two very different things. And as you start to embark on a lower total daily dose and more active, so a lot of you guys are going to be really ramping up the amount of activity you're doing, you know, that total daily dose, you're going to have to really watch it come down. Um, and so you'll find that these things are constantly changing in the background, but these are the general macro trends. But you can help stabilize things in the background. And uh, I, I really like, um, 
you know what Kathy mentioned about how it's it's not a rescue it's really it's really smoothing out the variability in your blood sugar life so yeah that's great thanks Peter uh, thank you very much Carl. so I want to um... Uh, we're going to call on you, Siddharth, in a second. I see your hand is up. I just wanted to first mention a question that came up last night, and I'll share that answer with everybody. Um, I forgot her name from New Zealand that's on the team, but she asked about the allergen statement on our products that say they're manufactured in a plant or equipment that has wheat um, and a couple of other things. So it's true. We do manufacture in a plant that has gluten, um, but... Uh, we test all our products as they come off the line. And in fact, she told me that in New Zealand, they test for 20 parts per million. The test that we're doing is 10 parts per million. So we do, uh, we've had certainly plenty of people with celiac uh, use, you can, um, without any problems. And as I say, we do test it to 10 parts per million. Um, but we do have to declare it on the allergen statement. And so, you know, you can take that as, you, um, as you're comfortable. So let's uh, go to the question from Siddharth. Siddharth, if you'll unmute your mic, I'll be able to unmute you. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so just to give a bit of context. So I've been uh, eating low-carb, high-fat for the last five months, and I've been in nutritional ketosis for about three, and I use pens, haven't used any Humalog, uh, for the last three months, but I use Lantus, uh, and uh, I have made all the mistakes that you guys have been talking about in terms of uh, uh, not experimenting with any baseline. I just went in, took my regular six units of Lantus, and had uh, Generation U can, and I had a massive spike up front, and then I crashed and burned it in, within the first hour and a half of my cycling. But having said that, though, uh, over the weekend, I did a 120-kilometer event in the UK, I had Generation U can as a avocado smoothie before I started, but I halved my insulin doses to three units, and I didn't have a hypo throughout. So uh, in terms of research for uh, as we go across this multiple day event, our sensitivity is going to go through the roof, and so those three units might become two units, might become one unit, and then using Generation U can, I think my biggest concerns are around my glycogen stores, and making sure that I have enough energy. So in terms of eating carbs, no matter what kind of carbs they are throughout the ride, uh, is that is that something that athletes usually do who are using Generation U can? Or would they just go with the super starch and have a bar or something like that? OK, so Siddharth, first of all, I'm going to give you one comment. Uh, not necessarily the most helpful one, but I'll just give you some one perspective, and then uh, we'll have some of the panelists respond to you. And I know Jesse's been doing low carb, high fat. I don't know if he's in ketosis, but he can probably share, share his experience. Um, I will tell you that the majority of people, uh, we don't know if it's everyone, because we just haven't studied this closely enough, but we get lots of emails. People who are in ketosis who use our carb stay in ketosis. So that's been kind of cool. So that's been really yep. fascinating. Um, because again, remember the insulin response to the superstarch is less than the insulin response to protein. There is an insulin response to protein, and even that sometimes can knock people out of ketosis. But I'm just letting you know that most people in ketosis stay in ketosis when they use UCAM. Um Let's put Jesse on here. Jesse, are you in ketosis or not quite? Um, no, I'm not. <clears throat> not quite. Okay. So um, I don't know. Let's put uh, let's put Kathy on. <laughs> Kathy. Any comments? Well, well, he asked about, I mean, I think that the dietary issues that, that are, you know, that there's some evidence base for for type 1 is that they're, um, that the, the glycogen stores are difficult to sustain. They're, they're difficult to, to keep at a reasonable level, in part because the variability in, in glycemia is, is, can be high. Um, Siddharth is perfectly, he's spot on in the sense that, you, that everyone is going to get more and more insulin sensitive as they go along. So that's, that's good because it means that the insulin burden will go down. Um, it, it, but it also means that after exercise in particular, becomes a very, very key time to, to have to think about how, what are you going to eat carbohydrate-wise 
to try to, 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 to take advantage of those key windows. Um, Cliff can talk about this a little bit more as well, but, but in general, athletes, anyone, any athlete has about two hours after they do exercise that is insulin independent for muscle, um, as long as the intensity of exercise isn't too high. And that's when the muscle is really reigns supreme in terms of any carbohydrate that you eat will go, the, go there. And, and before the liver gets filled back up again, so there, and then and then it's a gradual process after that. So there are going to be key windows um, to, to being able to try to keep the the liver glycogen and the muscle glycogen up over all of these days of of cycling because you're you're doing so many miles every single time you go out, um, and and the type one tends to to have a slower response overall. So it, so there is a challenge there. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, reading about uh, GLUT4 receptors and, uh, and and sort of this free pass in terms of uh, not needing any insulin. So m what I've been experimenting with is eating on the go while I'm riding. My heart rate is high, and I haven't really experimented with any carbs after ride because the blood sugar stays stable. Uh, but I think uh, I'll just shamelessly ask in a couple of weeks' time in April. I have set up a two-week experimenting where I will be riding every day for six days, taking a rest day and then riding again for six days. And I have never done that before. And it's 72 kilometers a day, 1,000 meters of climbing a day. And if, if there's anything you can help with in terms of setting up of an experiment to try Generation U can throughout those 14 days, maybe as an indicator to give to the team to say, hey, you know, Sid experimented in the UK and approximately this is what happened to his blood sugars. And I use a freestyle Libre. I don't have a Dexcom, but that's a flash glucose monitoring device as well. So I can share my results. But if there's any help that you can provide I'd in terms of this. I'd love to jump in and help you uh, with this one. This is definitely my wheelhouse. So I work with a lot of different uh, athletes from, you know, very extreme to, uh, you know, really re weekend warriors. And when you're, when you're entertaining a massive event that's multiple days, there's, there's a high level of depletion, um, as Kathy suggests. And that depletion has to be punctuated with your approach to when and how you take insulin. So during the activity, obviously, you're trying to remove as much insulin as possible. You can fit the bill. It's a great, steady, stable um, energy source. When you finish, uh, that's your opportunity to really, and a window to take in a much greater amount of um, insulin to basically replenish glycogen. So that's where you really have to think uh, less about the slow burning and more about the fast acting because you really need to be able to access that energy more uh, quickly uh, within multiple hours. So when I was training very competitively for Ironman distance racing, I would sometimes do two and three a day uh, sessions and my windows would be spaced out by the duration of insulin action. So, you know, if it's a PDRA or if it's Humalog, it's a, about a four to four and a half hour duration of insulin action. So I would, you know, finish a workout, take immediately five units of insul insulin, consume a pretty sugary amount of uh, juice, like healthy, fresh juice, um, mm -hmm. and some, you know, bread and things like that. And then uh, about four and a half hours later, I'd be ready to go again. And then you can would also be a next good idea um, to, to incorporate into that next workout. So if you just feed yourself, you can, and you're going to find that uh, it's going to mask some of the hunger. It's, it's a really great sustained energy source. But you also have to, for, for extreme circumstances like this, you have to be uh, ready to replenish. Now, the complicating factor for you is that you've got, uh, you know, Lantus, not necessarily a pump. And a pump would allow you to, for instance, really turn down that basal rate. So you're going to have to really adjust that Lantus daily dose to make sure that you're not putting in too much before these bigger days. And that's mm -hmm. something that I help people do ongoing is develop those Lantus doses and basal rates dependent upon activity. So happy to uh, talk offline with that for sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll probably drop you an email. Uh, but just, I mean, I lost the communication in the middle for a part uh, when you were doing the presentation. Do Generation U can have any recovery uh, sort of products as well, apart from just the starches? We, we have um, two of the flavors. We add protein to. Not really okay. a big deal, because you can, you can always mix them with your own protein. 
and they don't have a lot of protein. There's a rule in the United States where um, there was a rule until January that just went away in the college sports world where uh, coaches and dietitians couldn't provide any product that had more than 30% of its calories derived from protein. So we stayed under that limit. That limit went away. We're going to have products with more protein now that will come out within the next few months. I don't know if it'll be in time for the race. So you'll see in a, a, a scoop of UCAN only 7 or 8 grams of protein, a packet 11 or 12, because I mentioned that a, a scoop is about two-thirds of a packet. Um, and, then, and, then, and then again, the, protein, the, the bars are not intended to be protein delivery bars, so only 5 or 6 grams of protein. Now, I will mention that generally people get better use of their protein post-exercise compared to having protein alone. I'm generalizing right now. I'm not at all talking about type 1 diabetes, and I don't pretend to know the impact or the difference if, if you have type 1 diabetes with what I'm about to say. But if you only have protein after exercise alone, uh, only protein alone, up to 50% of it can be converted to glucose to replace the energy you lost during your, your workout, whereas with the superstarch steady replenishing the energy you lost, all of the protein, the majority of it at least, can be used for... Uh, for your muscle repair, for your muscles. So we, so you get better use of the protein. Uh, we perhaps don't need to have quite as much in our products, but but in any case, you know, we have a couple of flavors we add some protein to. Okay. No, thanks. Thanks for that. Um. So, uh, let's see. So we're not in any rush. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to either put up your hand. Or you can uh, type your message, your question in. Right now, there are no hands up, and there are no questions being asked. So I'm going to just wait, uh, you know, 30 seconds to see if anybody else has any questions. Otherwise, um, Jesse will be gauging interest in trialing the product. As I said, we'll be getting it to anybody that's interested. Um, can, can I ask another question, if you don't mind? Oh, yeah. I didn't. Uh, so I didn't like <laughs> uh, so uh, usually, uh, and. And, and I'm happy with the generic answer. If I'm going for a five-hour, six-hour ride, or somebody's doing an ultramarathon for same or more distances, do they just consume? Uh, so I, in the UK, got some pouches uh, to trial uh, from Kate here, who's the sales rep in the UK. And, uh, and I just consume one pouch. Uh, should that technically last me for six hours, or should I have another pouch in my bag to take after three hours or something like that? Okay, so again, I'm going to give you the general answer, um, not accounting at all for type 1 diabetes right now. Yeah. I'm, glad, yeah. I'm, glad, you're connected, I'm glad you're connected with Kay. That's fantastic. Um, the, the general answer is that a packet of UCAN lasts anywhere from, uh, again, generally, an hour and a half to three hours. I've uh -huh. seen a few people who are very fat adapted, as you are, get four hours out of uh, a single packet of 110 to 130 calories. Um, I remember one uh, uh, trainer who was very fat adapted and he used 50 calories to run 20 miles as an example. But you have to experiment and in the end, the, the biggest determinant, again, not, with, not, not when one has type 1 diabetes, seems to be how good one is, how fat adapted one is, how good at using fat one is. As you train on UCAN, you get better and better, right? Because you're making fast acting carbs less available to your body, it starts relying more and more on fat. And then, of sure. course, there could be differences in people naturally on how well they use fat. Um, Cliff or, or, or Kathy, any, anything you would uh, you know, add to that? Or feel free to correct me because you know, I'm not a scientist. No, that's, that's, that's right. I mean, as you, you basically, your muscles need to see a lot of the fat to be able to start to use fat. They, you know, that's the, the goal for most um, endurance training is to really, really try to spare as much glycogen as you can. So the response to you can all you can is doing is it's giving you that backdrop to try to keep blood sugar steady. And and what it what that means is that there's no other competition from um, other sources of carbohydrate. If if if, the, if your intensity of the ride is 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 at a level that you can really use fat effectively. Obviously, the more sure. intense the ride, the more of your muscle glycogen right. you're going to depend on, which is why that store needs All to right. stay. Oh, my Hi. Yeah, okay, sure. No, that's uh, that's really good to know. Uh, and again, I think I've got so many questions, I'll probably send them offline. <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Okay, 
Oh, somebody just told me they couldn't hear me. Sorry, I, I was saying that, uh, Sadat, you know, we're, we're not um, in a rush if you have any more questions, but you certainly can ask them through the Facebook environment. We're going to have the panelists uh, involved in that environment, and you'll be able to, you know, ask all the questions you want. You can email Cliff directly. Um, I'm just checking to see if there are any other hands up or questions. There are not. Last call. Otherwise, I'll thank everybody for uh, paying such great attention, taking all this time. And uh, we will, and, and really thank our panelists so much for their expertise. And I'm really glad Mary and Dana got on the call because now we've got you guys and uh, and Sarah that have been on the uh, call and been exposed to all this. So there are no other questions. We will end this now. Thank you, everyone, and look forward to uh, interacting with you on Facebook and any other place. Take care, everyone.